Welcome, everyone. It's uh, time to start this webinar, which is focused on the mathematical modeling of malaria transmission by mosquitoes. Uh, and this is sponsored by the National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis, which is based at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and is supported by the National Science Foundation through a, a cooperative agreement with the University of Tennessee. Um, so uh, I am your host for this. Uh, um, I'll be acting as moderator. My name is Louis Gross, and I'm the director of NIMBIOS, the National Institute uh, that is sponsored by NSF. Uh, I'm also the director of the Institute for Environmental Modeling, and I have a chancellor's professor position here in ecology and evolutionary biology and mathematics. Um, the way that we'll be interacting today is through the Zoom interface um, to ask questions. There's a little Q&A uh, button at the bottom. If you click on that, it'll bring up a window. In the lower part of that window, you can type your question. That question will then appear uh, up above, and you can see other questions that have been uh, uh, posted by others. If indeed you would like to upvote, meaning bring that question up towards the top of the tier of questions that will be addressed at the end of this. Uh, there's a little thumbs up button you can push that will uh, add your vote to move a particular question higher on the list of those uh, that are listed here. At the end of the um, uh, sort of formal remarks by our speaker today, I will be moderating the set of questions. In general, we will not be monitoring the chat button, so if you have questions, please use the Q&A button to, uh, to post them. Uh, this webinar is part of a series uh, that is sponsored by NIMBIOS. If you go to nimbios.org, you can go to our webinar series and see a recording of this webinar that will be posted um, about two days after we've uh, finished. Uh, you can also see the other webinars that, that have been uh, going on in this series, and we will have additional ones uh, after a break of a, a week or two here at the uh, end of the semester. We'll be continuing with several in, in May as well. Um, our uh, presenter today is uh, uh, Professor Vitaly Ganusov, who is on our faculty here in both microbiology and mathematics. Uh, Vitaly uh, came to us after a PhD at Emory University and then uh, went on to do postdocs uh, in the Netherlands with Rob DeBoer's group and also at Los Alamos National Lab um, with Alan Perlson and group. And uh, his background uh, is in the use of mathematical approaches to analyze immunological uh, questions. Uh, but he is part of a cadre of people around the world that have been working at the interface of immunology and epidemiology, combining two very uh, somewhat different fields and working to bring them together. Uh, and he's been here on our faculty for uh, six years now. We're very pleased to have him uh, join us for this uh, webinar. So, uh, Vitaly, um, uh, why don't you take over the audio and uh, video when it's when it's time? So, thank you, Lou. Um, I've been ten years here. Uh, <laughs> time goes by. <laughs> That's all right. Yes. Uh, so, for this webinar, uh, I I've decided that there is a proc well there's three major objectives um, so first I would like to introduce the topic of malaria and um, life cycle of malaria so all of you listening uh, know a little bit more about this um, pretty um, devastating um, disease then I would like to really dive into specific experiments that have been performed and I've collaborated with uh, the folks that uh, were doing those experiments to try to understand how uh, mosquitoes that are primary vector uh, that are transmitting malaria parasites uh, to their hosts, in our case it would be mice, how do mosquitoes transmit uh, the parasites? So, and what, what are the quantitative aspects of that process? And with these experiment, experiments, I will try to illustrate how one could use mathematical modeling and statistical tools to really uh, help to understand experimental data um, that comes from those experiments with mosquitoes and mice. Okay. Screen's so, all yours, Vitaly. Yep. All right. So here we go. 
So hopefully everybody can see my presentation. And so the, the talk will be about mathematical modeling of uh, malaria transmission by mosquitoes. Here's a very short outline of my talk. Um, I will give an introduction into malaria, uh, and then I'll dive into experimental uh, design as well as experiments with mosquitoes and uh, mice, which will be roughly divided in two parts that deals with uh, mosquitoes taking the blood meal and how that's related to infection, and then a lot of quantitative aspects of how actually the parasites that uh, mosquitoes carry, which are called sporozoites, uh, um, uh, are related to the infection probability. And hopefully we'll end up with some conclusions for you to take home. So uh, we don't hear much about malaria probably in the United States because uh, as this map shows, this is from WHO from um, um, 2017, United States had no cases of malaria as so many parts of the world, but in many parts of the world, including Africa and um, Asia and South America, uh, there are still incident, uh, um, uh, quite a number of cases of malaria. Um, China has been doing a good job at uh, reducing the incidence of malaria, as well as some other countries in the world. But it's still a big problem. So give, let me give you a little bit of introduction, terminology, as well as a little bit about the disease. So uh, malaria, when we say malaria, we really mean a disease. Right. And it's a disease caused by parasites, and these are unicellular parasites from the genus Plasmodium. Actually, Plasmodium parasites are quite ubiquitous in nature. Uh, and of course, humans probably care more about the, the, the infections that, um, um, that cause disease in humans, but, but there are Plasmodium parasites that infect other species, uh, such as humans, uh, primates, and rodents. And uh, as far as we know, with maybe exception of some of the parasites that infect uh, primates, uh, they're generally restricted. So parasites are generally restricted. They're a specific host. So there is not much of the transmission uh, between different species. So for example, malaria parasites that I will be discussing, which are infecting mice, are safe for humans. So th those mosquitoes cannot really transmit the infection and cause the disease in humans. There's five species of plasmodium that are known to uh, able to infect humans and cause the disease in humans. Out of these, falciparum, plasmodium falciparum, plasmodium vivax are, um, are, are the most dangerous in terms of morbidity and mortality they cause. Um, even though, again, as I said, so malaria is kind of not something that we hear too much about, there are still 200 million cases of the disease, so clinical malaria, so 200 million individuals actually get the disease every year. And about half a million or so individuals uh, die. Most of these uh, deaths are in the young children under age of five. Um, as I showed, there's a map uh, and there are, there are places when there is not much of uh, incidence of malaria. Uh, but those, um, those kind of advanced, some of those areas did have malaria before. And the advances were made not because there was a good vaccine. And in fact, there is so far, there's no good uh, vaccine available to prevent the infection or disease. But it was due to actually prevention of transmission, either using bed nets or controlling for vectors, which would be the mosquitoes, or a very effective treatment of symptomatic infections. Uh, and it's still available, although the incidence of drug resistant uh, malaria parasites is rising in um, different parts of the world. So in my uh, talk, I will be really, experiments will be uh, focusing on uh, parasites called Plasmodium ulei, uh, And these are a particular uh, species of uh, Plasmodium parasites that are natural pathogens of rodents. So let me jump into the life cycle of the parasite because I think to understand uh, some parts of my talk, it, it is useful to really understand the life cycle uh, of, of the malaria parasites. So if we start, uh, there's, as it's a cycle, you can start at any point of the cycle, uh, but we'll start with an infectious mosquito. So uh, a mosquito that essentially is infected would carry a parasite stage called sporozoites, right? And when that infected, uh, infectious mosquito um, looks for, uh, for blood and um, it would inject 
some of the sporozoites that the mosquito carries. Traditionally, I will show you the data, mosquito would carry thousands of sporozoites, but during the process of searching for blood, it would inject about 20 parasites on average, although there's a huge variability in the actual number of parasites injected between individual mosquitoes as well as between individual uh, blood meals that it takes. The sporozoites that are injected then um, get into the blood and then migrate with blood uh, and the target organ it has to um, uh, um, uh, target is the liver. Uh, actually, when the sporozoites are in the blood, they can get to other tissues, but if they get, say, to, uh, I don't know, lymph node or maybe some other tissue, then they will not really develop further. They will get arrested. Liver is the only place, as far as we know, where the sporozoites replicate and then progress to the next stage. So in the liver, sporozoites will invade, uh, will cause so and will form so-called liver stage. Then within the liver, the, the sporozoites, which essentially will essentially replicate within a single hepatocyte, which is a liver, major liver cell, and it will take about two days in a mouse, so for plasmodium ulei, and for humans, it takes between five to seven days, depending on the species of the plasmodium, to replicate in the liver. And this is considered to be a symptomatic uh, stage of infection where um, uh, essentially the host doesn't really know yet that there is an infection happening. After this period of time of asymptomatic uh, infection, those uh, sporozoites also, as they replicate, divide, they also differentiate into another form, which is then called merozoites. And after the, uh, the rupture of that hepatocyte, those merozoites leave uh, the, uh, the liver and start infecting red blood cells. And effectively, this is the period, and they will infect red blood cells, replicate within the red blood cell, burst, and then infect the new cohort of red blood cells. And this cycle continues uh, for a while. And this is essentially when the symptoms of malaria become uh, uh, clear. Right? So um, over the course of infection, those merozoites, some of these merozoites actually differentiate into another form, which is called gametocytes. And this is considered to be a terminally differentiated stage. Uh, and there are female and male versions of gametocytes. Um, which then circulate in the blood and uh, effectively don't really cause any harm as far as we know. But what's important is that when this infected human is now uh, bit by, uh, by uh, another mosquito, which is non-infected, the mosquito may pick up the gametocytes, which it has to pick up the pair, which then they would uh, fuse in the mosquito's uh, meat gut, diff essentially differentiate and uh, become sporozoites, which then will migrate to salivary glands. And I will show you a little bit of schematic of a mosquito where they will, so the mosquito will become infectious. This, peri this, um, this period of maturation of the mosquito from uninfected to infectious stage uh, takes, uh, depending on the species, but about two weeks or so of, uh, depending on the species of malaria, about two weeks. And then that mosquito now is infectious to go and infect another human. So uh, here's an example of a picture uh, of a mosquito taking the blood meal. And this is a particular species of mosquito, Anopheles stephansi. Um, and so you can actually see the proboscis. This is the part by which the mosquito actually uh, uh, penetrates and then takes the blood. And you can see this mosquito has taken a lot of blood. So just to give a little bit more insight, so here's a schematic of a mosquito, uh, very <laughs> rough, uh, that from, from one of the papers uh, I looked. And essentially, this is the proboscis, that this is what the mosquito inserts into the, into the uh, skin. Uh, and then when it takes the blood, the blood goes into mid gut, and then when it picks up uh, a gametocytes, this is where the gametocytes have to fuse and essentially form, it's called an oocyst, which then differentiates. So over time, from the oocyst, you get sporozoites, and these sporozoites have to migrate back and enter into salivary glands. And then in the salivary glands, essential mosquito is capable of injecting uh, through the proboscis um, uh, into the uh, a new host, the, the parasite. So this is how kind of the cycle completes, the infection of the mosquito and then injection of these sporozoites into, uh, into the new host. So um, 
The fact that mosquitoes are important for malaria transmission has been realized about 100 years ago. It's, it's, it's very kind of easy for us to think that uh, the nature and origin of infections and how they spread is kind of obvious, but if you go to older literature, 1800 literature, uh, it's not always clear how it was transmitted, uh, uh, the malaria, and we're, we're debating hypotheses. But then people have discovered that uh, the mosquitoes are the key, and then to really understand, well, how do we control malaria, especially in Africa or in some parts of, the, um, um, of Europe as well as the US, uh, people started actually building mathematical models to quantify uh, which processes contribute the most to the transmission of parasite. And uh, the credit goes to those efforts, probably to many individuals, and I recommend if you're interested in these questions, read this uh, very nice review in Post Pathogens by Smith et al. Uh, but generally, we credit Ross and McDonald by, for creating quantitative frameworks to really understand transmission of uh, malaria in the population. And the way eventually McDonald has done it uh, uh, was to formulate this parameter that is called the basic reproductive number that perhaps many of you have heard already quite a lot because we talk about COVID-19 and R0 of COVID-19. So malaria also has R0, um, although the value of that has been debated a lot. And uh, if you formulate a mathematical model of how uh, malaria parasites are transmitted in the population, the R0 or an average number of infected individuals that one infected individual will produce if introduced into wholly, uh, fully susceptible population is given by these parameters. So, um, and you can see the formula, but I'll explain M is the ratio of mosquitoes to humans. So that's how many mosquitoes are there in a particular, say, village per human uh, host. A is the biting rate. So it's a, it's a frequency at which mosquito by it's a human in a, in, a, in a population. B is the parameter, which is probability that infectious mosquito bite results in human infection. Uh, it's actually, we're gonna be looking at that. C is the probability that the mosquito that is uninfected becomes infected following a bite of an infected individual. Uh, G is the mosquito uh, death rate, and R is the rate of recovery from malaria infection. The the usefulness of this formula, and it seems like very kind of maybe simple and, and trivial, but when McDonald in particular discussed, if you look his papers from the 1950s, discussed the role of different processes in controlling the disease, we want to reduce R0. And we can see that not every parameter enters linearly in the R0, uh, in R0 um, uh, expression. In particular, uh, the noticeable thing was the binding rate, right? Or the mortality that comes as nonlinear. One comes as an exponential term, which is mortality of the mosquitoes, or the binding rate comes as a square. And that is uh, kind of uh, suggested that if we can regulate somehow how quickly mosquitoes die when they're infectious, it can dramatically improve, impact uh, uh, R0. Or the biting rate, uh, which comes as a square. And again, the bed nets, for example, that are used commonly are really used just, uh, are, can be quite effective in part because the biting rate comes as a square uh, uh, into, into R0 expression. It's interesting, again, you can actually look, uh, look in older literature and there's a lot of these parameters that actually can be estimated directly from the data. For example, mosquito mortality rate, I just recently read a few papers from 50s where it was actually uh, using some very interesting, cool uh, methodologies. Mortality rate of mosquitoes in the wild has been estimated, or for example, how many mosquitoes there are per human, or the biting rate. But what has not been really estimated is this parameter B. What is the probability that by, by an infectious mosquito results in an infection? This has not been estimated. And hopefully by the end of this talk, I will show to you how that can be estimated at least for infection of mice in laboratory. So um, even though malaria has been studied for such a long time, you know, over hundred years, there's still a lot of questions we don't know, uh, or there's a lot of questions, answers to which we don't know. For example, one of the big questions that are still being debated is, is taking blood meal needed for infection? And so, uh, here I need a little bit of introduction, uh, kind of. 
So when the mosquito is a, a, a kind of approaching a host, right, uh, it needs to look for blood, right? So it doesn't always know what the blood vessel is in the skin, right? So it does the probing. So it looks for the, for the blood vessel, and when it finds the blood vessel, it will start uh, sucking blood. So it does need to have, uh, take blood. So female mosquitoes generally need uh, to take blood uh, to be successful in, in terms of progeny. But the question has been, is it required or not? Why is this important? Well, it is important uh, because taking the blood meal is a very, very easy metric to see whether this mosquito has encountered this particular host. Um, for example, when, the, uh, when malaria vaccines are being tested in um, controlled settings, individuals who could be uh, humans would be could be vaccinated and could be controlled or placebo vaccinated. And then each of those individuals or sets of individuals would be exposed to a number of mosquito bites uh, uh, to see if vaccine works or not. So how is mosquito bite in, uh, uh, kind of defined? Well, if mosquito takes the blood meal, and it's very easy, you can look at the mosquito and you can just see red in it, or you can squash the mosquito and you can just see, did the mosquito take the blood meal or not? So, so this is a very, uh, um, um, uh, very clear indication of the encounter. However, if taking the blood meal is not required because mosquitoes sometimes can sit on the skin, uh, look for blood and not find it and they will fly away. So if that happens, then this mosquito is kind of removed and another mosquito is put on the skin of, of an individual. And then so for vaccine trials, if, bl if blood meal take is not associated with, um, with the um, um, transmission of infection or transmission of parasites, then every individual has a different number of mosquito bites that they're exposed to and that could really have a dramatic impact on the estimation of vaccine efficacy per one mosquito bite. This was a little long. Uh, second point is we always, are all the mosquitoes that carry sporozoites equally infectious? And this is interesting because generally it is assumed if a mosquito carries sporozoites, it should be infectious. Uh, however, people have noticed, and I'll show you this data just in a moment, that if you count how many times on average an individual in a particular area is bitten, in a particular village is, bit, uh, is bitten by a mosquito, and then you calculate how quickly they perhaps are developing the disease, at least you can do in cohort studies, you, there is a huge discrepancy between two numbers, and I'll show that to you just in a moment, and it was up to tenfold or so. So suggesting that not every infectious mosquito bite results in the infection. Uh, so, so, so we don't know the, whether every mosquito is infectious or if there's a difference between how infectious a given mosquito is in comparison with another. So, uh, so let me show you this data. This is kind of, I think, very nice. And just to illustrate again, in the 50s, people actually went into villages in Asia, in Asia or, or um, uh, Tanzania or um, in, uh, in lots of places in Africa, and they can actually calculate, so how many mosquitoes are there per person? And it would depend on which species of mosquito uh, maybe is prevalent uh, in the population. They can calculate man uh, biting rate, so you can have some numbers what the biting rate is by observing. You can see how many uh, infectious sporozoites there are. So this is a cold sporozoite rate, and you Generally, it varies between, say, 5%, 3%, and here's maybe 15% of these mosquitoes actually carry sporozoites. And then you can calculate the infective bites, how many uh, uh, infected bites per day does a human receive, right? And this varies somewhat, but generally it goes, it could be a, 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 maybe as, as high as one per day, one infectious mosquito bite per day. Then one can, what one can do is actually follow cohorts of newborn infants, and this is done here in the, this bottom, uh, uh, bottom figure, and so the, the, the lines is the actual uh, curves, and calculate so how often, how quickly do these infants develop the disease, right, malaria. And you can fit kind of a kind of saturating or exponential curve to that, and then you can estimate that actually the rate, which is called inoculation rate, is, about 0.15 per day. Uh, and 
they are they are completely non matching. So at least maybe fourfold difference to maybe almost maybe tenfold or so uh, different, uh, or or maybe even a hundredfold, uh, right? So uh, interesting. So uh, McDonald actually. So this is a quote from him. Uh, there is also evidence which appears conclusive to the writer that in this area only about one in every 100 bites inflicted on infants by sporozoite infected mosquitoes results in establishment of infection. And in another area, only one in 20 did so. Uh, there may be many causes for this failure and their relative importance can only be present, at present be assessed, but among them, some considerable weight must be given to the very small number of oocysts and sporozoites typically found in mosquitoes in such places, numbers which are almost negligible when compared with those commonly seen in experimental infections. So essentially what uh, McDonald was saying is that uh, perhaps uh, in the natural environments, mosquitoes carry so few sporozoites, they're essentially not causing an infection. And I will try to address that question in my presentation today. So uh, the team uh, that was involved with uh, doing the experiments, and that was Maya Aleshnik and Fatini Sinis, they're both, uh, they were both at the time at Johns Hopkins. Maya is now have, has graduated, and uh, Gayan Yanokian uh, helped as well with some statistical analysis too. So, and kind of, it's pretty cool to say, mention that some of these data have been these data have been published actually in Pulse Pathogen just recently. So, let me tell you about experiments. <clears throat> so, for these experiments, we used uh, well, Maya used uh, female Anopheles uh, Stephen C mosquitoes that essentially were uh, infected by Blasmonium ureae by feeding those mosquitoes on uh, infected blood. So blood carrying gametocytes, Blasmodium ureae gametocytes. And so then she waited for about 14 to 16 days. So depending on kind of experiment. So there were many experiments performed after the infected mosquito blood meal. So then the, uh, those uh, gametocytes will produce sporozoites. Then they used uh, female Swiss uh, Webster mice uh, for infection. And then she, what she did was she took one mosquito and one mouse and had an encounter between one mosquito and one mouse. And effectively, she recorded, so my recorded whether the mosquito took the blood meal or not. She took the time it took for the mosquito to probe before it started taking the blood meal, where the blood meal was taken, which, which location. We tested a few locations. I'm not going to be talking about that um, today. <clears throat> After this bite was happened, so she took the mosquito, then she kind of, you know, uh, dissected the mosquito, checked if there was blood meal taken, because physically you, you might see, but you want to confirm that when you dissect the mosquito, you open the gut and you can see the blood. But then also she would take salivary glands and would quantify how many spores or eyes there were in the mosquito using PCR. And then, so that was the mosquito part. And then for a mouse, what she did was she would just follow that mouse over time and wait until a mouse uh, develops malaria or not. So whether she gets a blood stage of infection. So the sporozoites invade the liver, replicate, and then invade into the blood, uh, form, form uh, merozoites invade into the blood. And generally, by day five, they can tell that the mosquito uh, did cause the infection of that mouse. If a mouse was uh, positive in terms of blood stage infection, by day 15, it was already at day five. So here's an example of the data, just a kind of a screenshot. So in total, we have 412 mosquito mouse pairs, and there's a multiple parameters that are recorded for these experiments, including probe time, whether the mosquito takes the blood meal, how many salivary gland uh, sporozoites there are, whether the mosquito, or whether the mouse develops malaria or not, and depending on type of feeding, which I will explain a little bit in a while, uh, in a little bit, what it was and the location. Most of the feeds were on the ear, but there were some other on the tail or abdomen. So, okay, let me start uh, into uh, giving some uh, insights, I guess, or results on this, uh, on, from these experiments. So does taking the blood meal influence infection probability? Uh, so what Maya did, she actually performed experiments in which she just recorded whether mosquito probed on the mouse and took the blood meal or it probed and did take the blood meal. And if you look here, so it was about 200 uh, mosquito mouse pairs. Uh, 
when the mosquito did take the blood meal, the infection probability was a little bit higher. It was 16% in those uh, feeds. And when it was no blood meal, it was about 14%, but this difference is not statistically significant, at least at that level. So we had about 200 mice. If we had about 600 mice, this difference may have become significant if the trend were, were true. But we, we must say from this is the difference is very minimal. So whether a mosquito takes the blood meal or not, it didn't really impact the infection probability. What's interesting is actually, if we look at the distribution of sporozoites in the mosquito in these two uh, kind of, into these two scenarios, and so what I'm plotting here on the right, uh, uh, right uh, in panel B, is a cumulative distribution function of sporozoite loads in these mosquitoes, right? So effectively it's, uh, how many uh, mosquitoes have sporozoite loads at 10 to the three or less, uh, 10 to the five, and all of them had less than a million sporozoites. You can see actually the mosquitoes that take, took no blood meal have slightly higher sporozoite loads than those that uh, did take the blood meal. And this will become a little bit important later. Uh, I will highlight that there's, there's more data that suggests there is something that about the parasites that impair ability of the mosquitoes to take the blood meal or find the blood. So uh, is this a, well, um, it's actually not. Uh, and uh, what, we, what we know now, and I, can show, and I will show you two movies very quickly, is that the way how mosquitoes actually inject sporozoites, it, uh, it happens when the mosquito is actually searching for blood. It's not really when it starts sucking the blood, when it finds it, but it's actually when it's searching. And the reason is because when it's penetrating the skin, it tries to, it also injects a lot of things from the saliva and salivary glands uh, that is trying to uh, uh, suppress perhaps immune response or some kind of activation of, of, of the host, um, presumably immunity. And so let me kind of switch quickly and I will show you two movies from intravital imaging experiments, which really show the skin of a mouse, which is the ear, and really proboscis going inside of the skin. And you will see how the mosquitoes actually are injecting sporozoites, which was happening during the probing period and not during the feeding. So. So this is one movie. So what you see here, this is a proboscis going into the skin. And these green thingies are, are the sporozoites. And essentially, the mosquito hasn't found the blood yet. It's really searching for the blood vessel. We don't see what the blood vessel here is. But the mosquito is trying to find it, right? So it, and that's going to repeat again. But uh, and you can see all this cloud that is actually coming from a saliva, from salivary gland that comes in. And actually there is a, uh, we believe, uh, it is believed currently that this is what actually causes the itching. Um, it's an immune reactivity to some saliva that causing the itching after the bite. And so let me show, so this is one movie and let me show you another movie. So again, here's a mosquito probing, didn't find the blood, went somewhere else in a bigger, and then you see all the sporozoites now in the dermal, dermal space that are moving around. So all these dots are sporozoites and they're trying to find the blood vessel to actually penetrate and then get, try to get to the liver. So I'll show you it again quickly because I think these are really, really nice. All right, that's good. Stop. Let's go back. Hopefully I didn't, hopefully I didn't lose anybody. All right, uh, let's go to the next point. Um, sporozoites. So as I said, it may matter how many sporozoites an infectious mosquito carry. So let's look at our data and ask that question. So first, uh, I think it's important to, to realize, so in experiments like this, uh, we actually got mosquitoes that carry different numbers of sporozoites. So depending on your experimental setup, you may actually get all the mosquitoes in your experiments having very similar uh, sporozoite numbers. But actually in our experiments, the majority of mosquitoes had about 10,000 to 100,000 uh, sporozoites in their salivary gland loads. But some mosquitoes um, 
uh, had less than 10, between uh, one and 10, and some mosquitoes had more than 100,000. But the majority was in this range, which is more, uh, I'll show you some more data that is within the uh, range of observable in actually in natural settings. So what we can do is, so this is uh, for 412 mosquitoes, for every mosquito encounter with a mouse, we can calculate whether the mouse got infected or not. So here's every dot is a, a mosquito-mouse combination. And on the x-axis you see in the panel A, spores divides per mosquito, and on the y-axis is infection probability. And what you can see right away, so we get it either zero, so the mice did not, mouse did not get infected, or it's one that the mouse get infected. And you can see right away that when the mosquito carries very few sporozoites, very few mice get infected. When the mosquito carries a lot of sporozoites, we can see that more mice get infected. So it's unclear what the percent here is, but from just visualization, but it's clear that there is some kind of dependence. So it, to, to uh, make this data a little bit more illustrative, I bin the data into, into uh, about 40 mosquitoes or so per bin and calculated average infection probability and then average uh, sporozoite per, per bin. And this is what it looks like. So the dots and confidence intervals are the data. And there is some basic statistical regression analysis, which is just experiment rank correlation done on this original data. And what we can see is that at low levels of uh, uh, spores, at low numbers of sporozoites per mosquito, there is almost no change in infection probability, very minimal. If I uh, use this data to do regression, there's maybe a little bit of an increase, but it's kind of small. And then after we exceed some particular threshold, and in this kind of multiple analysis we did, it looks like it's about 20,000 sporozoites per mosquito. It's kind of a large increase in infection probability. And again, somewhat relatively flat uh, uh, change at the higher level. On average, about 17.5% of mice in these total experiments became infected. So already we are confirming this idea that McDonald put in 1950s that not every mosquito even though all of these mosquitoes carried some sporozoites, not all of them could transmit the infection to the mice. So to do a little bit more uh, kind of deeper understanding of what the relationship between sporozoite numbers per mosquito infection probability is, we developed a series of mathematical models uh, to describe that relationship. So the simplest model one can come up with is called a single hit model and essentially assumes that uh, sporozoites would, would, uh, would, uh, could cause an infection independently. Uh, and it's a very st uh, standard traditional model to look at infection probability, but as well as in physics, uh, radiation, uh, kind of impact of radiation on tissues, et cetera. So very standard. Uh, uh, what is, so, but it, what it assumes, uh, the single hit model, is that uh, particles or sporozoites are somewhat independent in causing the infection, right? It's possible that there is some kind of maybe cooperativity or perhaps competition. So we had a model that includes uh, a power in this S where S the number of uh, uh, sporozoites per mosquito and N would indicate some kind of uh, cooperativity or competition and we call it the parallel model. Finally, the third model out of these three is, is, a, is a model which we call threshold model and essentially says the infection probability is step-like function. Uh, before some threshold, uh, you have a minimal infection probability and it becomes maximal after you exceed the threshold. And we, these are kind of basic models. We included a lot of different extension models from the kind of threshold model, which include some kind of slope. Uh, we tested logistic models, we, we tested double logistic models, models with top, threshold, et cetera. So many other alternatives. Uh, so how do we compare these models? So the way we do it is we calculate the likelihood of the model given the data, and we can calculate what's the probability of uh, infection given the mosquito carries particular number of sporozoites. And then we have the information whether the mouse actually got infected, got the disease or not. So DI would be one or zero. And we go through all the mosquitoes, uh, which is for uh, mosquito mouse pairs, which is 412. Uh, we can compare alternative models by using so-called uh, IKIC information criterion and IKIC weights, and I'll show you some of those W values. And the IKIC essentially weights allow you to weight how uh, good one model is in terms of fitting the data in, uh, in, the, in the comparison with other models that you're considering. Uh, 
And also we can actually ask the question whether the model fits the data on its own well or not. And we use Hoshimer let me show test for that by binning the data into about six to eight bins, depending on the uh, um, um, set. So here is a result of the modern fitting uh, of a model fitting to data. So in, in the left panel, we're testing three models, threshold, parallel, or single hit model. And we can definitely say single hit model doesn't fit the data at all. Parallel model, parallel model kind of captures the trend, but threshold is somewhat better, maybe three to four fold uh, higher likelihood. And it really nicely matches this rapid, somewhat rapid increase around 10 to 20,000 sporozoites and somewhat flattening uh, at the end of the curve. And if anybody's interested in, here's the parameters of the model. And we also tested few, as I said before, different models that include some kind of a threshold uh, behavior around 20,000. Uh, and they kind of, you know, there's some models that actual threshold model, the uh, strict threshold model is kind of one of the worst. So including some kind of smoothness in this area improved somewhat the fit, but they're still not dramatically different in terms of uh, AKQ weights. So, so we are finding that some kind of threshold is needed to explain this data. So it's a model that has just a continuous increase was not able to fit the data well, right? Why is that? And just to, to, to clear the suspense, we don't know. Uh, we have several hypotheses we're thinking about and we are testing, but we don't know. Um, for example, it's possible that how many spores are there are in salivary gland depend, uh, impacts how quickly they migrate to proboscis. So maybe if there's many of them, they are like migrating more. It's kind of simple, maybe concentration type of effect. Um, it is simply possible that the likelihood of deposition of the uh, sporozoites in the skin depends on how many there are in the salivary glands. And uh, Fotini has done experiments long time ago where she actually measured how many sporozoites are deposited by the mosquitoes that are probing for, uh, for blood. Um, uh, and uh, uh, she could calculate actually the deposit, deposited sporozoites in the skin and then calculate how many sporozoites there were in the mosquito um, um, uh, salivary glands after the probing. And indeed, there is a correlation between these parameters, but it's very, very poor. So R squared is 0.2. So you can see a lot of variability. Mosquitoes carrying the same numbers of parasites can deposit very few or very many sporozoites in the skin. Uh, it's possible that uh, uh, mosquitoes that have a lot of sporozoites, for some reason, those sporozoites are healthier in some ways. So it may be related to the fact maybe mosquito took a very good blood meal. Maybe there was better conditions perhaps for development of those sporozoites. So they are just more infectious on a per mosquito, a poor per sporozoite basis. So maybe that's what's something related to the threshold part. Finally, maybe the simplest explanation, or maybe this is what I kind of personally try to test, is that we have to understand that going from this mosquito to the infection is a multi-stage process. There's a lot of steps involved, and all of these steps have to be successful in order for a mouse to be truly infected and progress to blood stage infection. And if every step is, is of short duration, then um, it's possible that it essentially becomes a cum cumulative effect is nonlinear with some kind of a threshold. But if you have some other ideas, uh, please ask them in the Q&A or propose. Happy to entertain the idea, although we at the end have to do experiments to really test these. So, um, so we're finding that the threshold uh, so increased infection probability happens at about 20 or so, 10 to 20,000 uh, sporozoites per mosquito. Are these realistic? And the answer is yes. Although I must admit, there is not a lot of data on the prevalence of malaria in mosquitoes in the current literature. Um, I can only find a couple of studies I'll show to you uh, that are from 60s and there's some from 90s. Um, so I don't know now in 2020, what is the prevalence, but at least in 60s, there were mosquitoes present that carried 20,000 20, or more sporozoites. And for example, Pringle, Pringles et al, uh, I took the data in which they formed and sampled mosquitoes from that population. And roughly it's about 18% of mosquitoes carry more than 20,000 20, or more sporozoites. 
uh, it's actually cool that we can use our data where we can resample mosquitoes and we can actually use the data from the field uh, to say what is the prevalence of mosquitoes that carry different numbers of sporozoites and actually estimate this parameter B that I've mentioned, the probability of infection given bite by an infectious mosquito. And here I did it for one data set from 1966. And here's the probability density function for that infection probability per bite. And you can see that it's extremely wide, but on average it's about 10% or so, maybe a little bit less, 9% median. Uh, and if I look at another data set, so this is 1997 uh, from Kenya, uh, we get a little bit lower. Uh, so it's again, highly distributed to the right, but the median uh, infection probability is 0.65. So, so now with having this data and assuming of course, that this transmission data from a, from a mosquito to a mouse really matches or, or, or is similar occurs in humans, we can actually estimate the infection uh, probability per mosquito bite for field data. So uh, let me go into some other uh, aspects of, of the transmission. So one of the things that happens, uh, and unfortunately I don't have videos, but uh, uh, what happens when the mosquito is searching for blood, so it's probing, and as I've mentioned, right? So it's probing, 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 uh, does it matter how long the mosquito probes in terms of transmitting the infection? So we try to do that uh, through two alternative analysis. So one analysis is we just allowed mosquitoes, so Maya allowed mosquitoes to probe for as much time as they wanted until they kind of stopped probing or they took the blood meal and then that's, that was the end of the probing, right? And if we look at probe time, so this is in seconds, right? And now I kind of bin the data so you can kind of see it better. So all the data sets is 221 mosquitoes. Essentially, there is no relationship between infection probability and probing time. And even if I bin the data, divide the data into sporozoic numbers less than 20,000 or more than 20,000, there is no correlation either, right? So you would say that then it doesn't matter how long the mosquito is probing um, and, and then, and then it's gonna have the same kind of infection probability. But there's a caveat in this data. And the problem is if we look at the numbers, so the probe time, right? And the probe times go up to, you know, 200, uh, 2000 seconds. So that's a very long time. So, so if you think about realistically, how long does the mosquito have to look for blood if it's sitting on a human? Does it have, so this is, we're talking about 20 minutes, right? 20, 30 minutes. Mosquitoes don't have that time, right? So, so maybe this day, the problem of the data, when we just observe feedings and we don't allow mosquitoes, we don't destruct mosquitoes, we just let them as, as uh, so mice in these experiments are immobilized, so they can't do anything. Uh, so maybe there's a problem because we need to maybe look at much smaller numbers here, which we don't really have. Most of the data are kind of here in the, in the long, uh, long uh, probing periods. So Maya did another experiment where it were controlled feedings, that mosquitoes were allowed to probe only for 10 seconds, one minute or five minutes, and that's it, right? And actually in those cases, so here's the data, I mean, it's really three data points, uh, infection probability depending on the probe time, but you can already see that now it's kind of, it doesn't look really flat, right? And uh, we fit it a couple of different functions, so saturating function or logistic uh, 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 model to this data using likelihood, and uh, both of these models predict there is an increase in infection probability with time, but saturating function actually allows us also to predict what's the half saturation, and it's about 23 seconds. So in 23 seconds, half, there is a half of probability of causing the disease uh, or infection in, in the mice. So it's, it's very short, and essentially within a minute or so, probably mosquito has done anything it, uh, it needed to do to transmit uh, the parasites uh, to the mouse, which I think explains, if I go back, explains why we didn't have much of a correlation because a lot of this data has to be kind of uh, 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 constrained to 60 or so seconds uh, uh, feedings. So uh, kind of let me jump into more. Uh, 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 idea. So, does salivary gland sporozoite number uh, uh, influence blood meal take probability? 
And we can do the same uh, kind of uh, analysis is that we can look for every mosquito uh, and we can ask, okay, depending on how many sporzoids that mosquito carried, did it take the blood meal or not? So every mosquito was allowed to take the blood meal, but sometimes mosquitoes get frustrated and they don't take the blood meal and they fly away. And, and then the mosquito is excluded from the, essentially is counted as it didn't take the blood meal, right? And you can already see, again, like I always look, uh, always encourage everybody to look at the data, original data, and this is the original data, right? So you can see that maybe when the sporozoite, there's few sporozoites per mosquito, there is more uh, points here than here, but when we get to this side, there is fewer points here and here. And if I bin the data, this is bin data, it's actually the trend is uh, clear. There is probably not a big change up to maybe 20,000 or so, and then there is a very big change down when the mosquito carries more than 20,000. Essentially, this says is that if a mosquito carries a lot of sporozoites, it has lower chance of taking the blood meal or finding the blood. Right? <clears throat> so, kind of getting closer to the end, uh, we also asked the question. Uh, so, but does it matter how long the mosquitoes probe? That do 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 parasites somehow impair ability of the mosquitoes? to probe and essentially we found no correlation between these two parameters, although maybe uh, for highly, uh, highly infected mosquitoes that carry a lot of spores, so it's maybe the probing time is a little lower, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a very small, um, um, it's relatively high p-value to, to maybe believe it. So that's a final, I think, data slide for today. Um, so what we looked is another um, kind of correlation, if you will, is how does the probe time, so how probing time relates to blood meal probability. And you would, uh, there is absolutely strongly negative correlation between these two parameters. Uh, but the way you interpret that is not that this is independent variable and this is dependent variable. And I specifically put this slide, this graph in this way, because one would interpret that the more you probe, the less likely you're gonna take the blood meal. So this is one way to interpret this data. And that's not the correct way to interpret this data because the way it works is that mosquitoes that uh, take the blood meal, they generally stop probing, right? And so, so that means that essentially, if, you, if mosquito hasn't found the blood, it will continue probing. And that's what this correlation means. So the blood meal probability take drives the probe time. Yeah, not the other way around. All right. I am getting to uh, finishing my presentation. So in the series of controlled experiments, uh, we found that not all bites by infectious mosquitoes, and when we say infectious, meaning that all these mosquitoes carried some numbers of sporozoids, not all of these uh, 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 infectious bites resulted in malaria infection. And it's only about 18% uh, in our experiments, and obviously, that will depend on how many sporozoites mosquitoes carry. Um, interestingly, we found that the number of sporozoites per mosquito does determine the infection probability of the mouse. And uh, it does seem to depend non-linearly on the number of sporozoites going from 7% to about 36% at roughly 20,000 uh, sporozoites, although it is a little bit more gradual, so I'm kind of exaggerating. There is a strong threshold. It seems to be there, but it's, it's more gradual than, it is, uh, than I'm maybe saying. It's very important that infection probability does not depend on whether mosquito takes the blood meal or not. So a mosquito could take a blood meal or not, then infection probability is independent of that. Mosquitoes that carry a lot of sporozoites have really hard time finding blood which is really, really interesting because we, we don't know the mechanism of that, but this would imply that those mosquitoes that carry most of the parasites or big numbers of parasites, they have a hard time finding the blood. So, but if they have hard finding the blood on this host, they could still inject parasites and then go to another host and try to find blood somewhere else, or maybe another, another part of the body, but could fly to another host. So that may be implying some kind of strategy by the parasites, if they manipulate the, the vector in some ways. So first, they, they don't allow mosquito to find the blood, and so mosquito has to try to find blood on multiple hosts, as well as when there's a lot of parasites, sporozoites, 
then the infection probability uh, goes up as well. So it's a double, double win for the parasite. Um, it actually doesn't really matter uh, how long mosquito probes, uh, although again, if it probes for a very short period of time, it may not be able to transmit the parasites to the host, but feeding for about a minute or maybe somewhat less, is, uh, or probing for about a minute is sufficient for the mosquito to actually uh, uh, cause the infection. Uh, and I've, try, I've tried to ponder about one minute uh, or half a minute or so, and I was thinking, well, it, it seems like it's a short time, one minute, but if you think about a mosquito having a whole minute by you know, poking, you know, probing on the host and it's sitting somewhere, I think it's, it's very difficult for a mosquito to do that for a minute. It's probably because you will, you know, you, you eat your hand, et cetera. It's, it, it has probably seconds only to do so. So, so even one minute is already sufficient probe time that the mosquito ha must have in order to initiate the infection. So those in real situations, perhaps that also contributes to the inability of some mosquitoes to really transmit the parasites. And finally, the cool observation is that we now can estimate this, uh, this uh, parameter B for, for the ross mcdonald model. And uh, if we have the prevalence of, infectious, of infection in mosquitoes in the wild, and we make an assumption that our data are uh, translatable to human, uh, human malaria, which we at this point do not yet know. But, but uh, we're hoping at some point to get that information. I want to go, people don't do that, I think, a lot, but I would like to go through the limitations of this study, of the work. And essentially, this was work done with one malaria parasite, Plasmodium ulei, one mosquito species, and one mouse, right? Probably mouse is not maybe very important, but whether another mosquito uh, species or another parasite uh, will change this relationship, we don't know. It remains to be determined. I think we, as I acknowledged, we don't understand why there's this threshold behavior in terms of spores like numbers influence infection probability. So I acknowledge, I don't know. Um, the data are kind of noisy. So you would say we looked at 400 mosquitoes, but still lots of variability in the sporozoic loads and infection probability. So we couldn't really find which the best model out of the threshold, th set of threshold models we defined. So that's a limitation. Uh, I think it's not always easy to, to detect probing time. So when the mosquito puts the proboscis in, gets out, poops in, it has to be all recorded. And Maya did the best she could, but I think there could be some inherent errors in estimating those. We got a very huge range of spores like loads in our mosquitoes. I, I, I'm, I'm really curious why that is the case. I mean, they all were fed on the same blood. They all were kind of similar mosquitoes. So it's on similar blood, not the same, of course, because multiple experiments, but it's still interesting such a, how, possible, how is it possible to get such a high um, uh, range of sporozoic loads. And here we only looked at a few parameters that characterize transmission of malaria parasites from the mosquitoes to the mouse, right? We didn't consider some other ones which could have an implications as well. So I, I think, for example, age of mosquitoes, Maybe health of mosquitoes could be important, uh, you know, uh, and that's, that's an important limitation. So uh, I would like to acknowledge a few people. So Maya and Frutini uh, for performing experiments and, uh, you know, inviting me to this project to help them with some modeling and data analysis. I've discussed some of aspects of this work as well as this presentation in my lab and uh, um, um, kind of appreciate their feedback. You all online for uh, joining and just acknowledging NIH uh, for supporting this work. And I will answer any questions you have. Thank you, Vitaly. That was a great talk. Why don't you keep your uh, sh uh, screen shared up there because there may be uh, time to go back to some of the slides based on the questions. Um, I wanna start out with something though to give you an opportunity to place this in a little bit of context because uh, for those that uh, have been on the previous uh, some of the previous webinars, they saw the sort of classic SIR type of approach to analyzing uh, epidemics and disease spread, infectious disease spread. And you've done something quite different, which is often associated with macroparasites. Um, and do, do you want to just sort of put this in a little bit of a context 
relative to the, the classic SIR stuff um, in, in terms of the differences between microparasite and macroparasite types models? Hmm. So, well, so, so the, the uh, R0, uh, so kind of, I'm not sure, it could be answered at several levels. Just to say that malaria models are SIR type models, and this R0 expression that McDonald kind of derived was actually formulated in terms of differential equation, SIR type model that would uh, track infected individuals, uninfected, and vectors, and, and you would derive R0. Um, I mean, so, so if we think about epidemiological models, I guess, uh, there's two approaches you can think about modeling, but then we also kind of need some, some parameters to, to make sure that these models are uh, faithfully representing uh, the dynamics of the infection we're uh, considering. Um, and so, so, so uh, there's some things you can kind of try to measure uh, by uh, maybe in, in experiments or just observing individuals. For example, like for coronavirus infection right, right now, we, we have some data on maybe uh, time between infection and maybe symptoms or between symptoms and recovery or how long it takes, um, um, how much maybe shedding there is. So these parameters, you can kind of estimate directly and put in the models. But also a traditional approach, a big approach is uh, just by looking at epidemiological uh, data and fitting uh, models to seasonal influenza, for example, dynamics, and then trying to estimate some other parameters. So, so I guess the, the approach I took here was the first approach, meaning that let's look at specific details of the infection and try to derive epidemiological parameters that then somebody can say use in a model epidemiological spread of the disease, uh, okay. right? Well, it's just that you were really talking about burden. And, and how many uh, uh, borozoites there were per mosquito and per bite. And that's really getting down to uh, being more like a macroparasite uh, model in the sense of keeping track of burden to some extent. Yeah. Um, let's, go to, let's, go to some of the, yeah let's go to some of the questions. So uh, some of these have been upvoted. So the first one here. Uh, do the mice have any defensive mechanisms against the sporozoites? Um, I mean, I would guess just uh, innate immunity. So, so, so they do, uh, and we know this. Um, so for example, what we know is um, even if, uh, so, so, so one thing can happen is even if the sporozoites are injected uh, by the mosquito into the uh, dermis, Right, not all these sporozoites will reach the blood vessel. In fact, a big fraction of those will try to find the blood and the vessel and stop. For example, we don't know what processes, it could be antibacterial, some kind of antiparasitic environment perhaps in that tissue. Some of those parasites will penetrate in the blood vessel and go to the liver. But we do know that even if they get into the liver, they have to you know, exit from the blood vessel into the liver. And uh, there are other cells that are there which are innate immunity cells, such as Kupfer cells or macrophages. And uh, if the sporozoite doesn't do the right job, it could be kind of, it could be, could be killed in this process. Or even if it penetrates into the hepatocyte itself and starts replicating, we do know that sometimes hepatocyte may recognize that there's something going on and try to destroy that, um, uh, 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 a vesicle in which uh, 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 the parasite is replicating. So there's definitely no innate, uh, uh, no adaptive immunity in this particular mice uh, right. because they were not vaccinated or anything. But there is clear, there, there is clearly lots of uh, innate uh, immune, in, innate mechanisms that prevent the parasites from establishing an infection, say, all the time as well. Right. So that could speak for some protective immunity. Okay. But it and, would be non-specific. In, yeah. in, in humans, you know, there's certain traits, sickle cell being one, that uh, there's evidence. Yes. Uh, provide some defense. But that's at the blood stage. Yeah, that's, it's in humans. In the blood stage. Yeah, yeah, right. in the blood stage. Yeah, that's, that, that's correct. But it's really after the parasite gets out, it's just the red blood cells are so not so good for the parasites to replicate in. And so they don't grow as well. So that that the protection part. It's not really protection 
onto uh, in the kind of liver stage, I guess, at right. first. Okay. Um, so um, another couple questions that have been upvoted. Um, can the power law model not give a sharp threshold? Uh, for example, with large n values, I guess that was the power of s in there. Yeah. Uh, and, and if so, with only two parameters, it should do better than the threshold model, which has three parameters. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, we've tested. So then I called it Hill model. So, uh, but the Hill model did have a minimal value, some, some, so this is uh, pink. Mm -hmm. So it has a, sh so it has a um, um, soft kind of, uh, it has some minimal value, it has maximum value and uh, the slope, uh, the kind of, N value would indicate the the, the curvature, mm -hmm. but uh, the pro so and I estimate all three and then essentially you could try to force uh, this minimal value to be close to zero, but but it it uh, doesn't allow that. So even mosquitoes that carry very few spores or let's say hundred, they still have a, a possibility of causing the disease. So so there is something happening that it's it's much higher than these like for example parallel model kind of tries to capture on average, but, but it seems like these guys are very similar, uh, uh, similarly infective, I guess. Okay. And that's, I think, what we don't yet understand fully, like this, this, right. this part. Uh, while you're there, if you go back to slide 18, the one before this. Uh -huh. um, so uh, this is a question. Are all mosquito-mice pairs really independent? In particular, how well was the experiment controlled in terms of mosquitoes from the same cage? Mice raised in the same cage, daytime, time of the experiment, and all of that. So yeah, who knows? Good. It's so. That's a difficult question. That's a good question. Um, so we we don't know if they're independent. There is so this is a there is a batch of um, 10, 10 or twelve experiments. So there were not four hundred twelve mosquitoes. You can't do at once. So so right. We didn't control for uh, for for batch uh, mice were kind of maybe similar, but again, there is a lot of nuances to that, that maybe this noise that we see, or maybe sometimes we don't, the models are not, we can't discriminate, could be those effects. So maybe that's something we could go back and check on. Um, but I wonder if, you know, if we, if, if we introduce more and more covariates, it will be very tough to, um, to find anything because it sounds 412 is a lot. <laughs> But given the range of those spores-like loads that we see, um, it's you know adding extra variables will will probably not allow us to detect anything as significant or very few things. But it's a good point where yeah. that variability is essential. That if I understand it correctly, uh, if they're independent or not. But so in likelihood think... methodology, actually, we always we we assume that you know least squares. You assume that your viral load, for example, measurements over time are independent even though we know we kind of ex expect a virus growing exponentially will grow exp and so they are dependent so it's um it's a standard approach it kind of it works i guess but it's maybe it's a limitation to include covariants uh, on other aspects we didn't do that at this we had too little i think um uh, data to 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 look at that question okay uh, so this one, I think you've addressed a, a, a little bit, but it's a, as a theoretical immunologist, uh, would you care to speculate on mechanisms that might be responsible for the thresholds that were observed? I, yeah, I guess I kind of, when I put the alternatives up there, so that, that's the thoughts. I mean, I, I, I don't like to think about specific mechanisms because there's so many. Uh, so I, I am thinking that it's probably a combination of lots of uh, bottlenecks that the parasite experiences to go from the mosquito to to the blood stage infection. So because it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a, as I described in the in the uh, kind of schematic of the life cycle, it's a very it, there's a lot of steps mosquito so sporozoites have to make in order to cause the, the blood stage infection. And I think if every one of these is kind of uh, and and failing one of those creates no infection, right? So it's a kind of a cumulative process. So in order to exceed, so I think that's what creates maybe a nonlinear behavior is that just increasing each one of them by a little bit, you, you make a threshold type of thing. So that, that's a hypothesis at this point, where the way to look at it, I think, is really to try to quantify every step. And that's the idea that I'm kind of trying to put together. It's like, what's the 
process that happens when the mosquito injects. So how, uh, how, how would that happen? And what's the probability of that? And how does it relate to how many, mosquito, uh, how many spores or lights are there per mosquito? Et cetera, et cetera, every of these steps. And we have actually quite a lot of data that may allow us to do that. It's just hasn't been put together, I think. So, okay. so I think it's a cumulative uh, low probability events that just changed a little bit by changing how many spores are there are per mosquito. So. All right. So there's a dynamic upvoting going on. Uh, here's a question <laughs> that just got moved up. Um, it's, it's interesting to note that high levels of sporozoites in the gut may hinder infection. My assumption has been the opposite. How do you explain this phenomenon? Well, it increases infection. I'm not sure it, it, what it hinders is blood, blood take probability. So, so maybe I wasn't uh, clear enough. So. Okay. Uh, having more sporozoites per mosquito, it's not in the gut, in salivary glands. So in the gut, they start, but then they go into salivary glands, just to correct uh, the question. Uh, so the more sporozoites you would have in the salivary gland of the mosquito, the more likely it's going to initiate the infection, but it's less likely that the mosquito will take the blood meal. So, so there's the, it's a two, two process thing. First, it's a probing part, right? When it looks for, and this is what we believe, and I think there's most of the data now is really consistent with the idea that that's where the parasites are deposited, right? So this goes up uh, with the more sporozoites you would have per mosquito. It does saturate at some level, right? At about 20, 30,000 or so. Uh, but the chances that the mosquito will find the blood goes down. And, I, and, and you know, you could speculate that that's an uh, evolutionary strategy, perhaps, by malaria parasites, because for, for the parasite, it's good to be injected in multiple hosts. So if the mosquito doesn't find the blood meal, it still wants to eat. So it will go and find another uh, host and will try to um, um, find the blood there. And then again, prediction is it will not find the blood as easily as if it were carrying fewer spores. Right? Okay. Um, I think you've talked about this, and uh, but I'll let you. What's the proportion of sporozoite delivery per bite? I don't know if you. Yeah, have... so, so yeah, so I'll show it to you. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it, is there a correlation with the number of sporozoites in the salivary gland? So here that... it is. Here's yeah. the graph. So for those of you who uh, kind of uh, can still see, so. Uh, so, so this is sporozoites per mosquito, and this is sporozoites per mouse in the skin. So, right, and this is from uh, Medica and Sinus from 15 years ago. So there is a very, so there is a positive correlation between these two parameters, but you can see there's a huge spread. Right. So generally, the deposition, if you look at the percent, so, so mosquito carries say 10,000 sporozoites. In this particular case, it deposited one. In this particular case, it deposited maybe 100. So, so you can see that the, the opposition is generally tiny of what the mosquito carries. So from that study, I think the estimate was like less than 1%. Okay. In, and it varies a lot. Again, as I said, so in this particular case, it's just one sporozoite, and the mosquito still has 10 to 4. Right. So actually, uh, this person has clarified in the chat, uh, the question was per bite, not per mosquito. So this is the data. Well, this is, this is per bite. It is, okay. Yeah, so this is per mouse. So this is essentially in the skin. So what they did in this experiment was they let the mosquito uh, probe on the mouse and they took mosquito out, dissected, calculated how much mosquito has, and then they cut the skin out before the sporozoites could go anywhere. Okay. Right? And then quantify how many sporozoites were there in the skin. So this is per bite, essentially, right? So, okay. So this is in the skin, this is per bite, one bite, one mosquito, and it's a huge variability. But generally, you can see that's 1% or less most of the time. Okay. Um, so now this is, um, this is a, a very different question, okay? Um, and I'm gonna paraphrase it a little bit. So this is mm -hmm. from someone who was reading a uh, pop science article uh, for the concept of gene drive, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. proponents of which talk about the potential for actually causing the extinction of specific mosquitoes, mm -hmm. right? Yes, uh, yes. Those that transmit malaria. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, can you think of any for unforeseen consequences beyond potential ethical issues in uh, the deliberate extinction of, a, of one of these 
species yeah. and, and uh, yeah. that, that, that in some, in other words, some people might consider the species unnecessary in the, in the ecosystem. Yeah, 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 I, I understand, right? So, I mean, we got rid of smallpox, right? So nobody argues that we should keep smallpox around probably, right? But now there's a mosquito that kind of causes a, a, a problem in many parts of the world. You know, is it okay to eliminate it? Are we humans have the authority? So it's, it's, it's a very difficult question, ethical question. And I, I don't know if I can, um, um, I, yeah, it's a, probably a broader panel of people who are entomologists and they can say, well, if these mosquitoes are gone, yeah. uh, you know, is, are the ecosystems gonna be um, endangered or not? One of the things I can say about malaria is that there's multiple species of uh, mosquitoes that do that. And uh, I wonder if we perturb the system and we eliminate one mosquito species, I mean, is it possible that other ones rise? Sure. And, and, I, and I don't, so many, many places, they could have a dominant species of, uh, of, of, of mosquitoes that transmit the disease, but there's other ones as well. And there's a distribution, so there's two, three maybe species. So it's, uh, I think it, it would be interesting to know whether that, uh, you know, gene drive uh, therapies that are trying to be introduced, I've, I've, I've read about it. I, I don't know yet. It doesn't seem like they work very well, although that's maybe debated by the authors of these studies. Uh, I mean, they work for a little bit and then mosquitoes find a way, nature finds a way to, uh, to reproduce no matter what genes you introduce into them. Um, so it's yeah. I, right. I I don't know if I I I don't know how much to comment on that. Like I no, think that, that's 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 fine. Um, okay. <laughs> we could have we could have a whole it's a whole whole session about ethics and you know how do we do that safely, etc. I and I think it's a tough question. Um. So this is a, about the visualizations. Um. So the the mm -hmm. movie videos. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do they actually allow you to estimate the number of sporozoites that are transmitted? By a heavily infected mosquito per probe event, uh, or per bout of probe event events, is that has that been done with that, those movies? I mean, you can do it in those movies. How many movies you have? You know, five. I mean, the, every movie is very difficult to make, and there's a lot of uh, uh, tries you can make, and it's not going to look nice. I mean, it could be movement of the tissue. There's mosquito wear. I mean, you have to catch it. I think to make like one or two movies, you might need to do uh, like a hundred experiments. So you can definitely, I think, do it for these examples. Now okay. the question is, are these gonna be representative? So how many, how much statistics do you have to get to, uh, to, to be confident that you're measuring the normal things, right? Uh, well, there were several people who commented, wow, to those movies, so you should- Oh, I agree with you. I mean, thank, this thank is- whoever who developed them. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, it's, it just illustrates that it's possible, but again, we have to be careful. The, the, the danger of imaging and imaging studies is that you can't do a, a hundred of them, or you cannot have 412 of them, right? As we have in this uh, sure. data set. Okay. So, and you generally, in those experiments, you wanna maximize uh, your chance of seeing something. So you definitely use heavily infected mosquitoes that they are gonna inject something because if they don't inject anything, it's again, failed experiment. Okay. To see. So it is possible. I think it is hard to know whether they're going to be representative. Okay. Um, so there's uh, two sort of connected questions here. Um, what, what might control or limit the sporozoite numbers in an adult mosquito? Fantastic question. Uh, well, I mean, the one thing is space. Uh, I mean, salivary gland has particular space and I, I, don't know how much it can enlarge if the sporozoites come in. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I think, yeah. So we never, see, we ne so the highest, I think, in our experiments was, uh, was it 300,000 or 600,000 sporozoites per mosquito? Yeah. 100,000, right? So less than a million. Now, um, is that the limit? Good question. But I think in some cases, it's probably not really relevant to the in vivo situations or the natural environments, because it's very hard to see probably more than 100,000. Um, okay. um, well, that, that actually relates to the question on, in the experiments, how did the sporozoites get to the mosquitoes when they're reared in the lab for many generations? So 
so, so you feed them on the gametocyte. So you have your mosquitoes uh, that are uninfected, right? So you, 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 you generate them, mm -hmm. right? By feeding, uh, you don't have to feed them infected blood, right? But then you take an infected blood from an infected mouse and you let the mosquitoes feed on that infected blood. And presumably you need to determine that they have some gametocytes in it. So that has to, this blood has to be taken a little bit later in the infection because initially when these merozoites, the first stage is replicating, it's really just producing merozoites. And then over time, some of these merozoites become gametocytes. So if you feed uh, mosquitoes blood that has gametocytes in it, which you can determine by microscopy. So I'm not an expert, but I've seen pictures of what the gametocyte looks like in, within the red blood cell versus a merozoite. And then you can just feed and then there will be a proportion you have to make sure and that comes from experimental kind of experience what the protocol is in the lab. Then some uh, proportions will be, uh, um, uh, will be infected. Not 100%, but then you have to uh, kind of determine that level of infection. Okay. Um, so this is maybe give you a little bit of time to re-explain this. The infection probability is found to be independent of blood meal, uh, which this reader found uh, counterintuitive. Without a blood meal, susceptible mosquitoes may not be able to be infected. Uh, so that will be break of the transmission chain. Uh, uh -huh. Well, I mean, we, so, um, okay. So, yeah. So the transmission is independent of the blood meal, but most of mosquitoes will do the blood, will take the blood meal. Many of the mosquitoes. I think the average, so let me go back if I have that number. Sorry if I'm jumping too quick. So here, here's a graph for total 221 mosquitoes. So if you hear on the panel B, you take a blood meal probably, if you look at average, mm -hmm. Right, so the average is about like if I look at uh, mosquitoes that carry not a lot of sporozoites, it's about seventy yeah. percent. Okay. So, so, so the point is that mosquito uh, uh, will transmit sporozoites whether you took blood meal or not. That's the point of the blood meal take. But right, so whether it takes the blood meal or not, it, it doesn't matter for the parasite per se because parasite needs to get in the new host. If a mosquito transmits the parasite and then dies, parasite doesn't care anymore. Because, well, I mean, the ones that are in the mosquito do care, but at least it already infected the host. Okay. Right? So, I guess does that. I hope that that explains the, the, these graphs. So, seventy percent. It's only these mosquitoes that carry a lot of parasites have a higher, a lo lower chance of getting the blood meal, but it's still not zero. Right. I mean, it's still you know, it's still sub there. It's not zero. Okay. They will take the blood meal eventually. Um, uh, this is, uh, maybe I missed this, but is the probing time proportional to the number of bites uh, uh, or injection of the proboscis? Yeah, so, so, so this is how you define a bite. And so, so I had a lot of discussions because I don't say, so this is where it goes to malaria feel. So, so the bite is the whole encounter of a mosquito with the host. How many times proboscis is in and out? This is not counted, essentially. So, right? So it could be one time, uh, one time or rarely, but that means it would find the blood vessel right away, which is probably a rare event. So how many times each mosquito inserts the proboscis into the skin is not generally recorded. Mm -hmm. And I wish it were, but then it would be completely different right. experimental setup and people like a graduate student will have to sit and really count. I mean, it's like, it's, so. <laughs> It's a lot, like, okay. Yeah, it's you'd have to play some kind of really high speed movie. Yeah, 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 you have to see that because it's, it's pretty fast. So you have to really record. So it's, it's it, it, I discussed that and the bite is the whole process of one mosquito, one mouse, and it's really trying just whatever many times it tries to put the proboscis in. That's all one bite. Okay. So if we want to do it per proboscis insertion calculations, it would require completely different sets of data. And I'm not very certain that it really truly, I mean, it matters, it's interesting, but, but I mean, it's disproportionate amount of effort in terms of getting data, which is, I mean, okay. cool. So, well, if you're interested, let's do it. <laughs> All right. Write um, to me. Yeah. So uh, there's a few more, if you feel like sticking on here for another few minutes. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, we can okay. do a few more. Um, so, uh, thank you for your response to the question on independence of mouse-mosquito pairs. 
uh, this uh, viewer was thinking of some method of partial pooling or hierarchical Bayesian inference to account for variability between groups of experiments. Mm -hmm. But I guess have, there hasn't been really that group of experiments before. So we have, the, so, uh, you know, the, the, what we try to do is to try to be very open about the data and analysis. And so we have, so I'm just, I'm just going back to the data structure thing. So we have the label of experiments. So that person who is interested, you can, uh, the paper is not officially out, but uh, I can even send the data probably, or you can write to me, or wait until, if you want to be anonymous, you can wait until the paper out. The, pay, the data will be a supplement. So we have this experiment uh, number, which essentially is a bunch of mosquitoes. So there is no other maybe associated variables, but at least it can be structured by that. Okay. So, so that could be, could be perhaps used in the additional analysis. And we would like people to go and then, you know, test, uh, kind of see if we actually did the analysis correctly. I hope we did. But if you find more things, uh, absolutely. That would be fantastic if more people get involved and maybe do some additional analysis of the data. The data will be available. We will have some descriptions of what we did, et cetera. So please okay. go ahead and, 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 and explore. In fact, I'll just give a pitch. I use this data set, so I taught data science course in the fall, and this was the primary data set actually students in the class were analyzing from different perspectives, partitioning oh. the data. And, and Great. Was there, is there an open website for that course that shows the students' analyses, results, or anything? I did not create a, I, <laughs> no, okay. no but, but, but I'm just uh, kind of selling that uh, we, we, you know, Students had lots of different uh, analysis with the same data set. And so mm -hmm. a lot, all of it that we did was kind of repeated. So we kind of have confidence that we got it right. But maybe there's some other things people will find. Absolutely. Okay. So there's two questions uh, about that are relate to the R0, OK? And I'm, I'm going to try and put them together. So one is you know, how, how you formulate the expression of the R0. And, and the other one here is, uh, I'll read it. If biting rate is affected by sporozoite load, what would that mean for the representation of R0 in the Ross McDonald model? Would it mean that the biting rate squared term should be replaced with a different biting rate term uh, before the sporozoite load is uh, present, multiplied by a biting rate after, or would it be something else completely in the model formulation? Yeah. You've, okay. you've done, I mean, you've, by, you've modified it by coming up with a form for the B. Okay. Yeah, I think there is maybe a misunderstanding. So, so the only thing I can say, the R0, I didn't derive it. So McDonald did. Right. So this is just from his paper. And I'm just, but it is derived from just writing the differential equation, ODE, like ODE uh, based model, and then really deriving R0. So it's really from his paper. Uh, regarding the, uh, if the biting rate depends on the uh, infection probability, uh, uh, how many parasites uh, mosquito cares. We don't know that. So again, the biting rate is really, if you ask, okay, how many bites will a mosquito do on say multiple hosts or one host? So, right? So that would be your biting rate. So A parameter is how many bites per day a mosquito would do. We have not measured that. We measured one bite. Right? It was just one encounter. So what we have to say, it's like to do the biting rate, we'll have to have a mosquito and then have it bite one uh, mouse. And let's say it didn't find the blood. Then we have another mouse. Then we have another mouse. And then right. we get a distribution. And then we ask, how is that biting rate changes with how many spores or ice there were? Right? So, this was not, so this is what we estimated is really per one bite, one encounter. And biting rate is really uh, encounters uh, with multiple hosts. Okay. If it makes sense, I guess. To yeah. Um, so we, we, we don't know whether mosquitoes that carry more sporozoites will have a different biting rate. What I can tell you is that mosquitoes that carry a lot of sporozoites are, not, are less likely to take the blood meal. And that could have that they will have more biting possibilities than other uh, individuals. But we, don't, we have not measured that. This is not, uh, we don't know that. This okay. is just conjecture. Um, I'm going to, uh, there's uh, uh, just a, a couple more here. Do you have any work on the mathematical modeling of within host malaria infection dynamics? Uh, so this, this area they think will provide great insights into the mode of transmission. 
Uh, yeah, we have, uh, I have a project. So actually my, I mean, depends which aspects. Yes. Mm -hmm. I can actually go to here the, so there's something that we do in terms of within host malaria dynamics. It's really related to protection by vaccines, how T cells look for infection in the liver and sporozoites in particular. So we are asking how do vaccine induced T cells uh, localize the infection and how they eliminate it. So then my whole grant that I have right now is on this subject. We also have a little bit of uh, one project that we are finishing uh, how within host malaria uh, dynamics of blood, blood stage infection depends on microbiota uh, of mice. And a colleague of ours uh, that was here at UT but moved to another institution found that actual microbiota seem to de de define how quickly malaria can replicate in the blood, so blood stage. And so we've been modeling, kind of trying to understand mechanistically how that happens. Okay, so, uh, and I think there's uh, one more here that's a bit different. Uh, in a natural environment, an individual has the potential to encounter a number of potentially infected mosquitoes. Is it possible that the sporozoites could work cooperatively in the individual in order to increase the infection probability, uh, or is it more likely that the sporozoites are sort of working independently? So this is about yeah. whether the sporozoite load actually is a effective and whether multiple bites lead yeah. to a uh, higher chance of progression to disease. So, yeah. Um, so I, I, as a physicist, I'll give you the simplest, exp uh, simplest idea is that if we think about human body and size of the body, right, and then mosquitoes will probably bite in multiple places. And then we think about the liver, one of the maybe the largest organ in terms of like physically single organ, lung and liver are the big ones. Mm -hmm. Although, so, so the likelihood that sporozoites that are injected by the mosquitoes will, will know about each other if it's different skin parts and then they go through the blood and enter different parts of the liver, I think it's probably very unlikely. And remember, I've mentioned to you that on average, the estimate is it's about 20 sporozoites are injected per mosquito bite, although it varies a lot. And I showed you 100 or one. Right. Uh, but 20, and then another mosquito injects 20 somewhere else in some other part of the body. So I think it will be very hard for them to communicate. Okay. I think it's probably independent, but if you have two bites by infectious mosquitoes, which carry about the same sporozoite numbers, you have a twice as high chance probably of having the disease. So okay. I, I think it's probably independent. Um, okay. Well, different. thank you very much. We, we've gone through pretty much all the questions and, uh, and it's an hour and a half. So <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, you know, we've still got 50 participants online, so that's great. Uh, you've, you've maintained their attention. Uh, uh, Vitaly, thank you very, very much, and thanks to all of those who, uh, who uh, participated in this, and we will get this posted uh, within a, a couple of days, and I'll throw up the uh, list of questions as well. Thanks an awful lot, Vitaly. Yeah, thank you. That was, that was good. I hope you, hopefully people found it interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.